Um, a very warm welcome to the latest in our series of public lectures. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is Stephen Graham, and I'm involved with international colleagues in organising the series. Um, so a very warm welcome. We're really lucky tonight to have a visitor from Eunice Alborg in, uh, in northern Denmark, Ollie Jensen. I was particularly pleased to welcome Ollie because he was a visitor here 18 years ago um, when he was doing his graduate studies and uh, we're, we're, we have long lasting friendships since those moments. So it was particularly nice to have Amali back in the city. Um, we've even been discovering some old haunts. Um, Ollie is a professor of urban, design, urban theory and urban design and um, he's based in the Center for Mobilities and Urban Studies, uh, which is partly linked to the Department of Architecture, Design, and Media Technology. And all his work is very interesting because as a designer and an urban researcher and a sociologist, he's very much engaging with questions of mobilities, the everyday movements and, and flows that, that keep cities going, that keep societies going, economies and cultures, and their landscapes and infrastructures. And he's very much interested in that as a design project, a design project including the familiar terrains of, of engineering, of architecture, of planning, of urban design, but also all of the massively growing worlds of digital media that um, increasingly overlay the worlds of mobilities. So we're, we're very excited to hear some of Ollie's latest work from two of his new books, Staging Mobilities and Designing Mobilities, um, but before I uh, finally let Ollie have the floor, I must apologise for the slight flicker on the screen. Apparently, this is going to be fixed next Monday, um, so we're going to have to we're going to have to live with it, I'm afraid. So uh, please, please do do uh, forgive us for the technical problem. Um, with that, with that introduction complete, Ollie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Steve. Well, thank you, um, Steve, and also to Jeff, who's not here, for, uh, for making this possible. And of course, I should start with apologies for letting there go 18 years before I sort of came back to, uh, to Newcastle. Um, but I came back, and I guess that's what matters. Um, I want to speak to you about uh, some uh, research been done lately uh, within the Centre for Mobility and Studies in Elborg, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about um, a framing of particular uh, fields that I'm sort of uh, trying to push forward with my research and, uh, and, and together with good colleagues within the design um, area. Uh, this is roughly the, the plan. I'm going to say a few things for introduction and I'm going to speak a bit about uh, the theory framing of staging mobilities and designing mobilities and move away towards mobilities design as an emerging field of research and talk a little bit about what that might be. And then I want to turn to uh, an empirical example of some depth. Uh, tunnel design, uh, we'll return to that, um, and a shorter, uh, almost like just a vignette, uh, related to flying at the end before I um, move towards uh, some concluding remarks. But first of all, who am I to stand here before you? As Steve said, I'm a professor of theory. Uh, I'm in the now the merged department between architecture, design, and media technology, which is a strange creature, but has many um, opportunities for those who are interested in playing with other disciplines. Uh, and I'm one such character, probably because I'm a, I'm a hybrid myself with a degree in political science, sociology, planning, and lately a technical degree in mobility. So I'm sort of trying to breach across uh, rather than, than monodiscipline. Um, I'm, was, instrumental together with a colleague in setting up the Center for Mobility and Urban Studies, which is practically reaching uh, three faculties, humanities, social science, and engineering and technology. So I try, try really to push for that idea. I also lately started uh, the Mobilities Design Group and a cluster for mobility and tracking technology, which is really techy with all sorts of uh, infrared cameras and, and you know, whatever you could imagine. Uh, so I guess that speaks a little bit to why it doesn't maybe uh, come across as a very sort of multidisciplinary talk. I want to start by um, using the contemporary city and its relationship to mobilities and design as black backdrop, um, and also present key dimensions of the mobility term, as well as how it link this to urban design and design of infrastructures. Um, so I will focus on the nexus between mobility 
um, infrastructure design and arguing for the establishment of the cross-disciplinary perspective uh, called the Mobilities Design based on the work um, that I've um, been done doing. But before that, I think um, we could all agree on uh, agreeing on the fact that the city has changed and there's many ways of putting it uh, and some of these diagrams are familiar to you, I'm sure, uh, from the monocentric to the multiplex. Um, I'm particularly fond of secret prices. Uh, talk about from hot boiled eggs to to scrap to um, called, uh, fried eggs to scrambled eggs. This idea that the city morphologically has changed and has been redistributed in a set of, of various interlinking networks of infrastructures, and that of course has huge repercussions for the way we think about cities, but also how we design for cities. Um, and in this huge picture, I've been trying to do a bit of work. Uh, focusing on a particular way of thinking about this, and obviously that means a lot of other things will fall away from the perspective, um, but um, we'll return to that. So basically I've been setting up a couple of um, frameworks for this. The, the Stadium Mobilities book is the theoretical sort of framework that I'll, I'll explain a little bit about, and then the Designing Mobilities uh, is um, connected to four uh, empirical cases that I'll be using as illustration. Um, as some of you might be familiar with the term of staging, this is uh, leaning very heavily on the work of Henry Goffman uh, and his uh, drama metaphors or drama metaphors. <coughs> and of course, um, saying that, uh, it's very important to say that it does not mean that social life is a theatre, but it means that you may understand it as a theatre. And that's a huge difference there, of course. Um, so, there will be certain things that you will notice and other things you will not notice as you start thinking about the uh, mobilities from the point of view of drama, uh, drama and the metaphors related to theatre. <coughs> so basically this is my take on, on things. I'm studying situations, very specific concrete situations, mobilities in situ, arguing that you can understand them as an interplay of three uh, fields, the material, setting spaces and design, social interactions and environments. So we're doing mobility with our bodies, we're often doing it uh, together with or against others, and always, of course, within settings of materiality and physical design. And very simplistically, I'm thinking about this staging of a particular situation like that is in two dimensions. One stage from above through planning, regulation, institutions, and the other stage from below uh, through people's choices, motivations, acts, and those sorts of things. I'll return to that in that. In really more detail. So, stated from above could be planning documents, procedures, design, design manuals in particular. I'm particularly interested in design codes, um, scripting for architecture, uh, but also, of course, regulatory frameworks, le legal frameworks, with laws and institutions uh, will, will uh, come into that perspective. And equally, if you think about stating from below, I'm looking at how people carry their bodies, how they move through spaces, how they inter uh, interact through. Uh, various media uh, connect to infrastructures, cars, trains, uh, but also of course just uh, uh, pedestrianism and, uh, and the way that uh, mobility uh, becomes a key feature of the situation and how people present themselves within that, uh, within that nexus. So basically I'm arguing that we're embedded in multiple mobile stagings and you can think of any kind, I mean my research uh, is partic not particular uh, connect to any sort of um, of mode of transport, um, of looking at uh, any uh, type of transportation or any type of movement and trying to understand the nexus between what is scripted and staged uh, beforehand through, uh, through uh, architecture, design and planning uh, and what people uh, on the ground, so to speak, chooses to do within those frameworks, so to speak. Also, um, as part of that framing, um, I'd like just to speak a little bit about what I call critical mobility thinking, which is to me a uh, perspective that is aware of both the problems and dark sides, but also the potentials. And I guess this is something that has come to me during the last 10 years where I've been working in the architect and design department, because I'm brought up on the left-hand side column. I'm a social scientist, so I'm pretty good at spotting problems, but I haven't really been very good at it. I haven't been taught to look for potentials. I mean, that's not our, that's not our game. Uh, whereas I found that all my colleagues, or at least a lot of them in architect and design, are really, really good on looking for potentials, but tend not to be so engaged with problems. This is, of course, 
a huge exaggeration, but still, this is the kind of, of doubleness to uh, what I think is important when you talk about thinking critically about the bullies. That you're aware of the issues that connect to power exclusion, failure systems, breaks down environmental restraints and what have you, but also how you think about the mundane sites as potentially inhabiting uh, new experiences, empowerment, social interactions on new services, depending on how you think of it. And I think um, our research in the, uh, in the mobility design group is very much trying to pay attention to that doubleness so, uh, so that we don't uh, want to probably stare of us blind to either that this is problematic or it's, 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 uh, it's all the potentials. We're trying to understand um, the, the sort of doubleness to that. So if that's the kind of sort of framework that we're offering or, or looking uh, through, the glasses we're looking through, then I want to speak very briefly about the four case areas in the book. Um, I took the model uh, and the, uh, this, this perspective and applied it to three or to four different modes, uh, so to speak, but also four very different sites, four very different geographies, if you want to say so. One, looking at pedestrianism within an archetype of, uh, of urban commercialization that we know quite well. This is a shopping center in Olborg, Fries. It's a layered sort of uh, machinery with underground parking and uh, gangways, flyovers, and, and what have you. And we did quite detailed sort of uh, on site ethnographic studies in there, trying to see how people negotiated the space, how they came uh, about, how they moved, and trying to understand the situation from the point of view of materiality, sociality, and embodiment as something that was given from above through design uh, and design codes and legislation as well as something that was quite clearly negotiated in motion in the situation by choices made by people on the fly and on the roof. Equally, uh, in the book, uh, I'm looking at cycling uh, design, cycle systems. This is a picture from almost in Denmark. I looked at three uh, based on a, a research council project that we did um, where we looked at uh, cycle uh, systems design in Aarhus, Copenhagen, and, and Odense. This is from Aarhus, and it's a very sort of um, rather rather uh, standardized uh, uh, traffic design solution. You look at how uh, bicyclists inhabit these spaces, how they interact with cars and other bikes, and how they sort of also perform a lot of social activity within that space. And this is probably one of the things that is the most important thing about the mobility journey, as far as I'm concerned, is that mobility is much more than movement from A to B. It's social interactions, it's production of identity and culture, it's all these things that seems to fall a little bit out of the, the picture if you talk about traffic engineering or traffic design alone. The, uh, the third mode, if you want to say, uh, uh, to say it's, it's related to, to trains. This is a picture from uh, the commuter station, the airport station in Auckland, Copenhagen, which is the busiest commuter station where you have regional train meeting, metros, and the whole sort of, of, um, of system, and trying to understand the, the enrollment of the subject into that particular technology and those huge uh, technological systems, how people are trying to negotiate and how they are inhabiting these sorts of spaces. The last uh, case was what we call the 100 km city, which is not a city. It's a motorway stretch from August to, to Weile in the southern part of Denmark, uh, on Jordan. Um, and the whole point here was to try and understand the motorway as an interaction space, as a site where not only cars were moved from A to B, but where there was lots of interaction dynamics between. So the research assistant of mine went up and down uh, this particular stretch with a, a camera mounted on the, on the windscreen and one uh, on his forehead, looking how people were interacting and trying to understand the subtle dynamics um, of this. In the workshop yesterday, we heard Eric Gloria talk about the internal uh, discussions within the car unit, this was much more trying to understand the connectivity between them, which is quite difficult obviously, but still has to do with the fact that this stretch, uh, that the situations playing out here between the materiality, the sociality and the embodiment is something that is much more influential and much more important than just looking at it as if it was a uh, simple movement um, as well. So, um, out of this research, uh, a number of, of sort of postulates comes out, and I don't want to go through all of these, but one of them from the Stadium of Mobility's book was that we should try to engage more to, the, to look at the nexus between mobilities, the irritation and, and research, and then the design world, so to speak. And thus, leading us towards discussing this, you know, this notion of mobility's design. 
And one way of getting into that discussion was uh, by making a small diagram referring to uh, Buchanan's report from 1963, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the trafficking talents, in where Buchanan makes this bold position, sort of says, well, there's something, seems to be something wrong where, when we talk about trafficking architecture separated fields. So why don't we think about traffic architecture? And I think that was a pretty bold proposition. I also think it didn't really make much difference. But still, the, the idea of, of trying to think across, and I think this is fast forward to the contemporary situation while we talk about not traffic but mobilities and not architecture but design. Also, the reason we talk about design in more general terms and more wide terms rather than architecture is because, and I'll return to that, but that's because we would argue that if you're looking at the situation, what affords a particular mobile situation is not necessarily confined to what architects do, but it might be informed by design decisions made by engineers protocoling particular systems and particular technologies and so forth. Thus, a larger or more broad understanding of that seems to be um, relevant. So we sort of try to move towards this connection between mobilities and design. And what if, I know I'm in a, an architecture school, so I'll be very careful about the next couple of slides saying what design is. Um, but this is, this is just to show the plurality or the, the differentiation of, of notions of design you can come across. Um, if you go into the dictionaries, you can see uh, to mark out this there or to set something apart for someone, shaping of environments, process to develop physical objects, some focus on the physical objects, other would focus on, on the materiality, devising a form of an object without having the actual object in front of you, etc. My personal favorite is the old school Kevin Lynch uh, definition, arguing that design is the, is the playful creation, strict evaluation of the possible forms of something, the possible forms of something, including how it's to be made. And that something needs not to be a physical object, nor is design expressed only in drawings. And although attempts have been made to reduce design to completely explicit systems of search and synthesis, it remains an art, a sort of peculiar mix of rationality and irrationality. Design deals with qualities, complex connections, but also with ambiguities. And I think this, 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 this discussion or this identification um, seems to point quite well at where we're moving with our work in terms of design. Uh, this, the, 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 the connection between uh, the very sort of rational and, uh, and engineered and, and, uh, and almost like uh, scientifically based decisions and frames of knowledge combined with, uh, with uh, much more uh, creative approaches and much more uh, irrational, if you want to call it that, as, as Lynch uh, says, and ways of engaging. And that's sort of trying to get a little closer to the core of the design, but if you zoom out in a more social understanding of that, Design has also become the pervasive aspect of the modern society. This is a quote from the, the book Design and Technology, where they argue that design is a pervasive aspect of modern society with a large number of practitioners, such as great, and a great range of subfields, such as industrial design, architecture, systems design, human computer interaction design, service design, strategic design, and innovation. And I think um, this, this sort of speaks to the, 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 the sort of proliferation of, of, of design um, and also why it's really important to go beyond architecture and thinking about design in much more general terms when we look at the, uh, the influence on the abilities. Um, Alvin Yaneva argues that design is a sort of way of enacting the social, it's another way of thinking about it, a way of producing additional attachments that make a variety of actors, actors congregate, forming different groupings, assembling social diversity, tracing networks with wood, steel, polished surfaces, blinking signals, big bing doors, I think it's called, Linking a lot of greater buttons, design connects us differently. Linking disparate heterogeneous elements and effects, thus entering a game of producing, adjusting, and enacting the social. And, and likewise, thinking about design as environmental affordances, as stated Rosen and Bastas does in this quote, where they argue that um, the moments are made possible by specific, con specific conjunctions of experiment, experience of co-realities and material surroundings. The physicality of the city constantly interacts and collides with our bodies, and our bodies respond, go along with like, all these environmental affordances. Of course, there's a link to the whole discussion by Gibson and, and others in terms of uh, in terms of affordances. Um, I've recently come across some thinking by Tim Ingold that might be, be sort of you know, just, just the, the, the final comments on, on, on design here. Uh, in his essay, or in his, his, his book chapter, Design Environment for Life, um, he speaks of design as, as the sort of open-ended Field and, and, and hence why design must fail. Design is about shaping the future of the world we live in. 
yet in many ways it seems hopeless, a hopeless endeavor, predicated upon the failure of our predecessors. Had they succeeded in shaping the future for us, then we would have nothing left to say, to do save to fall in line with the imperatives. Design, it seems, must fail. If every generation is to be afforded the opportunity to look forward to a future that can call its own. And furthermore, that the designer, let us say, is a dream catcher. If there's a distinction between design and making, it's not between projects and their implementation, but between the pull of hopes and dreams and the drag of material constraints. It is here where the reach of imagination meets the friction of the materials, where the forces of ambition rub up against the hard edges of the world that human life has lived. And I think these are sort of these are important prompts to the discussion and to the understanding of, 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 of the meaning of materiality um, with, the, uh, um, with the imagination and how that comes about as a, as a challenge uh, when you look at the specific situation. So, Engel argues that environments are inherently variable and thus therefore design should be concerned with flexibility, but also that it's constantly transforming the life conditions and ultimately that there is tension between hopes and dreams for the future and the material constraints. So design should invite, invite people to a form of conversation around this, this tension. I think these are, these are important um, sort of markers for, for, um, for how you can think about uh, certain elements of design. Um, but I want to sort of end this, this, this part by, by referencing a completely different mindset, which is the, uh, the quote from Manuel Lefebvre in uh, 1974. The production of space, in which he, he says, uh, consider a house in a street, for example. The house has six, six stories and an air of stability about it. One might almost see it as the epitome of immobility, which is concrete and its stark, cold, rigid outlines. Built around the 1950s, no metal plastic stage yet. Now, critical analysis would doubtless destroy the appearance of solidity of this house, stripping it, as it were, of its concrete slabs and the thin, non load bearing walls which are really glorified screens, now covering a very different picture. In the light of this imaginary analysis, our house would emerge as permeated from every direction by streams of energy which run in and out of every imaginary route, water, gas, electricity, telephone lines, radio, television segments, and so on. This image of immobility would then be replaced by an image of complex mobilities, the nexus of in and out conduits. By depicting this convergence of waves and currents, this new image, which more accurately than any drawing or photograph, um, much more accurately, would at the same time disclose the fact that this piece of immovable property is actually a two-faceted machine analog to, analog to us to an active body. And once a machine for calling um, massive energy supplies and for information-based, and an information-based machine with low energy requirement, the occupants of the house perceive, receive, and manipulate the energies which the house, house itself consumes on a massive scale. Or the lift, kitchen, bathrooms, etc. This is written by the favor prior to any Wi-Fi uh, or any other types of connectivity. So this idea that that we're sort of um, having a a number of, of, of artifacts and, and elements uh, that that, uh, that look static but inherently have the, uh, uh, the the connectivity and the and the, and the mobility mobility accesses connected to it seems to point at a, a particular way of engaging with. Uh, not just mobility, but also with design. And this is what we're trying to do in the mobility design group, where we ask this very, very simple and pragmatic question. So we ask how are specific mobile situations enabled and afforded or prevented by design decisions and interventions? And one particular example that I like to use also to get away from this idea that it's uh, designers at, at per se, um, is, is um, to try to, to learn from, from what we talk about in the urban design area that we're looking at, at, at things in plan sections and flows and try to understand the three dimensionality of things. So that's the sort of very spatial dimension to it. But equally, we're also trying to understand from the point of view of the situation that it's actually uh, a lot of other things that could qualify. This is a, um, a cartoon that you can find in uh, John Whitelake's John White uh, book, Critical Mass. Uh, he nicked it from Siegfried. Uh, and basically, this, this is a... Uh, this is, uh, very, very straightforward experience that many people have um, that the, uh, the programming, the protocol of programming the wave of green for pedestrians uh, of obviously means a lot to the situation on the ground. The mobility in situ is, is, is shaped by that particular thing. Um, alas, those, or hence those people who are programming these protocols or making these protocols are actually 
creating a really, really important thing or really important dimension for the, uh, the situation, even though they might not consider themselves a little bit designer. And so I think if we're looking at a particular situation like this, you could argue that uh, the embodiment um, and, the, and the connectivity to the social, to the technical system that has been protocoled in this particular way actually um, uh, makes, it, makes it reasonable to look at the uh, the, the programming of green wave or red waves uh, as part of the mobility design influence in the situation. This leads to a, an even more design uh, oriented conversation. I would argue this is a diagram taken from a, a PhD thesis that is just uh, being uh, will be defended in the next within a month by Didi Ben Exlak, whom I work together with. She's a designer. And uh, away, I'm coming back to the, the tunnel, uh, but this is, this is sort of opening up for discussion about what are the parameters of the situation that we want to engage with. Uh, like, for instance, here when we talk about them, dimensionings, lights, materials, edge conditions, and other things. There's a whole vocabulary of design uh, parameters that is important to infuse into the vocabulary of mobility research uh, to try to understand this, this sort of, of, uh, of, uh, of the nexus, if you wanted to. Also, questions like design speed, volume, space, tendency, direction, etc. I'm particularly interested in design speed as a concept. This idea that a particular uh, trajectory or route or system has been planned for a particular speed, um, and, and that particular thing can uh, affords um, a, a certain experience of that uh, infrastructure, but also that if you're not complying with the design speed, something else will happen, right? That either you will fall off the tracks or whatever. So I think this is this is uh, these are some of the parameters that we are that we're trying to explore, explore. Um, and also connecting it very much to the embodiment and the sensorial. So um, this is a diagram from a, another case we work with, which is the parking lot, trying to argue or trying to question uh, the the touching, the tactility, the view, the the, the visuality, and the, and the smells and the sounds of of a parking lot. Uh, so we're trying to understand it the engagement of these very, very materials, uh, material uh, components with the embodiment and try to understand how they afford a particular situation. So I want to um, argue that the mobility is perspective looking at situations and then uh, trying to open up conversations with the design thinking and design disciplines, looking at particular variables and, 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 uh, and design parameters um, is, a, is an interesting venue for trying to push the research in mobility is towards a more material and concrete foundation, but equally an attempt to try to offer some of the lessons from the mobility's turn to the designers, uh, so there's a kind of, kind of two-way conversation. So I want to move towards um, an example, and this is the tunnel design uh, example from uh, from Didis, uh, PhD thesis. Um, we're going to very quickly just, just mention uh, some of the discussions we had related to this particular um, this particular theme, uh, but it also connects to the, the, the multi-scalar discussion of this because this relates to this the project site we're looking at, and it's actually part of a suburban development plan from the 70s, uh, the suburb to Alborg, and it's organized after all these <coughs> modernist principles, the CM and the SCAP principles, with zoning, traffic segregation, and, and a sort of very functionalist way of thinking about these uh, particular spaces. If you map it, that particular site down to uh, what it's actually programmed for, we will find that roughly a third is what we would call destinations, and that's buildings, gardens, and so forth. Uh, and roughly a third is, is uh, the infrastructure system or access space, roads, parkways, parking lots, and roughly one third is in between spaces. These are the verges, these are the sort of leftovers, or these are the unprogrammed uh, sites of that particular city or that particular area. Um, so if that's the context of it. Imagine a concrete tunnel, um, and uh, and we've explored that by talking to people who move through it, who inhabit it. Lots of people can come, can agree that the tunnel is, is, is a space of fear, but it's also a space of inhabitation. Uh, lots of people hang out there, also very friendly uh, teenagers coming home from school, etc. So it's not necessarily a, a, a sort of a piece of gangland or whatever you want to imagine. It, but one of the things that we've been working with here is the tunnel dimensioning. You know, how can you think about what is it? Why, why do these particular tunnels look like they do and what is the, the rela relations between the length and the, and the heights of them and how do they, um, how do they invoke uh, particular sensations. Um, just before I came here I went to the exhibition park and we go under the tunnel concrete and there again I met 
a couple of kids testing out the tone dimensioning by their voices, right? Shouting out to, to measure and to, to sort of engage with that particular uh, materiality. Um, so it's a very, very sort of, um, it's a space where the, where, where, the, where the dimensioning is really important for the way that we, um, we understand that particular uh, space. And in terms of design, you could think about uh, if you could, uh, uh, Instead of having one uh, uh, sealed up space, you can might have, might uh, punctuate it or, or do other things with it in terms of design. Um, but also, of course, materials. This is a concrete uh, surface which has all this sort of acoustic effects. Could you imagine uh, cladding it with different types of surface materials? How would that work in terms of, of the sensation? Um, the edge condition was something really important. A lot of people said about the, the tunnels that that you know it's really a hard edge, and so you can't really understand what happens on the other side and is that something you can work with. Um, and finally, we also discussed uh, the light moon condition, which is probably the most uh, striking feature because these creatures are dark at the, at, at the day and then they're lit up at night, the reverse uh, situation, so that when you go into them you cannot see what's on the other side of it. Uh, so a lot of people said, well, we're sort of a little anxious when we go out of them because we go out into the dark, so there's a whole discussion about the lights uh, in, in, in relation to that. The, uh, the diagrams on the on the side here um, require much more explanation, of course, but that's to show the way we sort of play and engage with these sorts of things um, in, a, in, a, in an attempt to try to understand the materiality of these uh, these spaces and how they are uh, coming together with the social interactions of the people using them and the embodied perceptions and sensations of people in those spaces. Um, I want to just end the, the, the empirical uh, discussion with another very, very quick reference. This is just a completely different setting. This is a, a paper I'm writing with a colleague of mine, Phil Vanini, um, where we found that each of us have different flying experiences. Um, I seem to be using most of my time in, in one of these aircrafts on the, on the left-hand side, which is Boeing 737. Uh, Whereas Philip seems to be using a lot of time in these in levers, which are the water planes of British Columbia. Uh, and so that discussion, that experientiality, uh, made us uh, start reflecting upon how we sense uh, the difference of being enrolled into those two different systems. Uh, the pressure cabin aircraft technology, which we're all familiar with, has particular uh, sensorial uh, sort of uh, bearings on us when we, when we are in, in these spaces, whereas uh, the beaver. I haven't been there, but I take Philip's word for it that it's very noisy. It's not uh, a car pressure cabin, so you fly very low or very, very. Um, you don't fly very high, so you can actually see a lot of things. Whereas as you're up there, media, you don't really have any geographical references uh, for those sorts of things. So that's another way of illustrating how we're trying to unpack the uh, the situated abilities from the point of view of the materiality, the sociality, and the embodiment. Um, and this is of course just very, very quick. Um, touch upon um, a different a different way of thinking about these sorts of things. We are in that that paper trying also to get much closer to the uh, the technology of these these systems and how they afford particular uh, experiences and sensations. Um, we haven't discussed that a lot, but right now there's a lot of conversation about this, particularly in America, uh, about the uh, seating of the of the jet crafts because they, they people tend to get really aggravated if they don't have. Uh, they are, uh, or if they, there seem to be lots of conflicts in, about space internally in these sorts of, of, of air carriers these days. Uh, so there's, 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 there's plenty of things um, that they would spin off. Um, so from a situational perspective and analysis uh, of, of mobilities and looking into design and trying to open up this, these, these variables and trying to add a nomenclature and a language of design parameters and design understandings, um, we might be moving towards the mobility design as a new research field. And that I want to speak just a little bit to here at the end. If that's the way uh, you would look at it, what could be the focus of studies? Well, situated practices doing exact and interactions, but also, of course, looking at, a, at the whole array of, of elements compiling this or coming together in the situation. So we'll be looking at objects, artifacts, systems, technology, spaces, spaces human and non-humans. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the sense that embody mobile practice and the kinesis. Um, in, the airport, in the aircraft paper, we talk a lot about uh, acceleration, deceleration, and heights, and how, you, how, how these sensations are bearing on your, on your way of sensing uh, uh, the actual um, 
vulnerability situation or situ vulnerability situation. Methodologically, our what sort of approaches? Uh, situated empirical, foregrounding material, um, I'm sort of deliberately taking those two first, but also increasingly trying to work experimentally and creative and performative. Um, some of the spin-offs coming out of the work with Tunnel uh, and also with the parking lot is actually that we now, uh, together with the municipality in Denmark, we are trying to experiment with the design of tunnels and parking spaces, trying to see what would the reconfiguration uh, of some of these sites mean to people, how do they understand them and how would we uh, be able to uh, open up a conversation about the monofunctionality of some of these spaces and maybe have that as a critique. Epistemologically, or frame, frames of thinking, uh, to a certain degree, post phenomenology uh, pragmatism is, uh, is a strand of thinking that I'm particularly interested in, but also uh, what has come to be called the modern representational or non representational uh, types of, of, uh, of, uh, of thinking about the knowledge production could be relevant um, as, as pointers. Um, so I think the question would be, how do we get our theories to work for us in a way so that we can design exciting, exclusive, stimulating, efficient and livable open spaces in the transit systems of the New City? Or in other words, how do we invite new means and interactions at the same time that we create safe and functional spaces? And I think this is where the mobility turn actually has something to offer to a lot of the professions and disciplines designing and organizing these mundane spaces. Um, because mobilities often take place in what some term on places and it's more than effects are often invisible it's pretty hard to necessarily tell and predict. so i think research into design and mobility opens up to a material practice seeking to understand and provide languages for these mundane but increasingly important practices so mobility is design research explore how humans as well as non-human materiality matters by targeting situational mobilities and this is a person crossing uh, the street in, in that area we work with uh, and he's, he's, he's been doing that for ages and he's not supposed to be there, he's supposed to be down in the tunnel uh, but he's there and has been there every morning um, for a very long while and, and, and the way he engages with that particular space uh, and the way he inhabits that space is significant uh, to, uh, to the way that, uh, that he sort of, his practice challenge almost the planning idea and the doctrine laid over that particular system. So, we should explore if future mobility systems hold the potential to become more socially inclusive, less environmentally restraining, uh, more resilient, risk adverse, more flexible and less vulnerable. This is all coming out of resilience literature and, and the sort of dark side issues. But perhaps also more inspiring and attractive, or maybe even more open-minded and fun, um, even though that might be seen as a less serious agenda. I think uh, the, uh, the potential of these sites, and it's by no chance that I depicted the, the metro in Copenhagen, which is a really nice example of pure flow space with no programming. I mean, you can't buy, any, you can't buy a newspaper or a cup of coffee or anything. You know, you're not meant to hang out there. It's not a, it's not a, it's, it's a machine for moving people, which is all right in its own right, but it's also missing out on a lot of potentials for other things. Yeah. And I think if you start looking at a site like that with the perspective of mobilities uh, in situ or staging mobilities in situ, um, I think you would see the potentials coming out. So what I've been arguing um, in this talk is that mobility design could be uh, a different way of thinking about and bringing together pieces. There's nothing completely new in any of this. So if there's anything new, it might be the, uh, the way to combine some of these elements into a framework that tries to understand uh, how, we, how, we should, how we should work with these mundane uh, transit spaces and how we can interpret them uh, in a particular way and how we can open up for that uh, of course, this conversation about uh, the meaning of, of everyday life mobilities. So, thank you for your attention.